Today, the crypto market recovers from Monday's steep sell-off. Bitcoin miner Core Scientific grows its partnership with AI company Core Weave again. And as crypto markets continue their wild swings, we speak to John Wu of Ava Labs to find out where he thinks crypto is headed next. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World, I'm Brandon Gomez. Crypto prices are staging a partial comeback after Monday's big sell-off. By noon Eastern, Bitcoin rose 3.8%, back above $56,000. That comes after the cryptocurrency briefly fell to its lowest level in six months yesterday. Meanwhile, Ether climbed 3.1% to $2,500, and Solana jumped 11% to $145. Yesterday's sell-off took place as crypto traders were caught in a storm of carry traders unwinding their positions, raising concerns about a U.S. economic recession, escalating tensions abroad, and increasing uncertainty about the outcome of the U.S. presidential election. Crypto-focused stocks like Coinbase and MicroStrategy were in the red yesterday amid the crypto sell-off, and it seems like Kathy Wood's ARK Invest took advantage of the lower prices, as the firm bought nearly $18 million of Coinbase shares and more than $11 million of Robinhood shares as the market sank. Okay, let's talk about the top stories for today. MicroStrategy's executive chairman, Michael Saylor, joined CNBC's Squawk on the Street earlier this morning, where he said that the recent crypto conference, Bitcoin 2024, marked an inflection point for the cryptocurrency, as lawmakers and other politicians, as well as CEOs and billionaire investors, descended on Nashville for the event. Now, Saylor also discussed the strategy of the company he co-founded after the firm reported Q2 earnings last week, noting that MicroStrategy's Bitcoin holdings rose to 220 26,500. MicroStrategy's a Bitcoin development company. We're an operating firm, and that means we have some advantages over a trust company. We've got permanent capital. We can generate cash flows. We've got operating flexibility. Um, our shareholders want more Bitcoin per share. They think if we get more Bitcoin per share, that's creating shareholder value. That means we're pursuing BTC yield. Whenever we can uh, do a capital markets transaction that's accretive and generates more Bitcoin per share, we'll do it. We have, uh, we have uh, the ability to sell equity into the market at a premium to net asset value. We have the ability to issue convertible bonds. We have the, uh, the ability to generate operating cash flow. We're just gonna keep uh, generating more Bitcoin per share any way we possibly can by selling the volatility of the asset class and then sweeping it into the underlying asset. Next, the SEC is pushing back on Coinbase's demands for personal communications from Chair Gary Gensler. In a filing on Monday, the agency called Coinbase's request breathtakingly broad because it sought essentially all the documents that in any way relate to crypto assets. Now, late last month, Coinbase filed a court document addressing the crypto exchange's subpoena of SEC Chair Gary Gensler and other discovery disputes. The filing says that the exchange was unsuccessful in its many attempts made through June to collect documents from the agency. Agency. That includes those related to Coinbase's IPO and Gensler's communications. Coinbase withdrew its request for Gensler's pre-chair communications, narrowing its request in that filing. Now, in this new filing today, the SEC says it already produced all non-privileged documents concerning the crypto assets at issue. In a post on X yesterday evening, Coinbase's chief legal officer said, quote, if the SEC is going to engage in an unprecedented regulation by enforcement campaign, the least they owe to those they target and the public is transparency. Last, Bitcoin miner Core Scientific is expanding its partnership with AI firm CoreWeave yet again. This morning, Core announced plans to deliver another 112 megawatts of infrastructure to host CoreWeave's high-performance computing operations. That's on top of the 270 megawatts of infrastructure already pledged to the AI company. Core Scientific said that, all told, the newly expanded deal brings the total potential revenue to $6.7 billion over the next 12 years. This, of course, is part of a growing trend of crypto miners turning to AI as a means to grow revenue, especially after the halving back in April cut mining rewards. Core Scientific stock soared 13% around midday. All right, for our main story, let's turn our attention back to the markets. Crypto World's Talia Kaplan spoke with John Wu, the CEO of Ava Labs, to find out where he expects crypto markets to head next as this volatile trading week continues. Wu also discusses utility on the Avalanche blockchain amid new government agency partnerships. 
crypto markets were hit with a steep sell-off to start the week following a sharp drop in financial markets around the world, with many analysts saying heightened recession fears were to blame, coupled with escalating tensions in the Middle East. At one point yesterday, Bitcoin was trading below $50,000 for the first time in six months. Now today, Bitcoin recovered some of yesterday's losses, trading above $56,000 as of around noon Eastern. What do you think was behind yesterday's sell-off and what does it signal to you about crypto sentiment right now? Hey, Talia. Well, yesterday, the sell-off, a lot of that was what you attributed to, the macro environment um, where it became a little bit choppy and Bitcoin and the crypto asset class as a whole is very volatile. There are also specific things related to Bitcoin and the asset class that contributed to that sell-off as well, I would say. Um, you know, one of the great things about blockchain is the transparency. So people saw that the U.S. government had moved some a lot, a large, you know, close to two billion dollars of Bitcoin from one address to another. That was an indication that they may sell. On top of that, um, it was triggering leverage, uh, deleveraging on a lot of the Asian exchanges. So you saw that in a, in a panic sell over the Asia at nighttime. And then on top of that, you just had this Ethereum ETF. So you're coming off of that positive sentiment. But at the same time, there are Ethereum trusts that have high cost structures. So people naturally will sell that to go into a cheaper uh, Ethereum spot ETF. And that unfortunately happened during choppy markets, so it caused more selling. Now, the recent drop in prices has eaten into Bitcoin's gains for 2024, but it's important to note that the cryptocurrency is still in the green with Bitcoin rising 32% since January as of midday. What's your outlook for Bitcoin in the coming months? I heard you say in a recent interview that you can see Bitcoin going well above $100,000. Do you still feel that way with this week's sell-off in the mix? Yes, I, I do. I see the medium term as being very, very positive for Bitcoin and the whole asset uh, class, if you will. The first thing is I think Morgan Stanley just announced that they are now going to uh, be able to allow their 15,000 wealth managers basically sell the Fidelity and the BlackRock ETF. That's a new channel. Um, frankly, a lot of the Bitcoin ETF right now have been retail and some institutional, but not really to the higher net worth uh, RIA channel. That is fantastic and positive. If you look at the Coinbase earnings that we saw recently, in terms of monthly users and other streams of revenue, you see that it's actually stabilized or actually growing nicely. So users are not leaving the platform. They stay, they're staying there and they are more engaged. And that's helping Coinbase actually generate other revenue, not just the, the transactional revenue from, from trades, because trades went down in the last quarter or so. So, and then most important thing I think is you're seeing real use cases. I'm at the, the what they call BASS, the Blockchain Applications uh, Stanford Summit. And basically it's all about applications. You have great academics here, but you also have great um, real world developers trying to create applications on the blockchain. This is the first year that it's by itself. This it used to be attached to another conference. That's another indication that applications and utility are coming. And if that's gonna happen, that, that bodes well for the, um, the asset class in both the medium and long term. And we're going to talk more about utility in just a bit. But I heard you talk about the presidential candidates in that recent interview I referenced earlier, noting that the Republican nominee for president, Donald Trump, is pro-business and pro-innovation. He has come out recently as a crypto-friendly candidate. In fact, in May, Trump's campaign started accepting donations in crypto. And of course, the former president was the keynote speaker at Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville nearly two weeks ago. We're also learning that Kamala Harris's team is reaching out to crypto experts to learn more about the industry. In fact, speaking with us at Bitcoin Nashville, Congressman Ro Khanna said he advised her team about digital assets. How do you think crypto is starting to shape this election cycle and how much influence do you think it can have on the upcoming presidential election? The upper echelons of the political world we know now recognize the community of crypto because the community of crypto is a force. Um, we know these stats, over 53 million Americans actually own the crypto asset, uh, one of the, you know, part of the asset class, either Bitcoin or others. And a lot of those are young voting Americans. So it's a big voting base. On top of that, the, um, 
the super PAC associated with crypto actually uh, raised over 207 million, I believe. That at the time, uh, when I last looked, was actually bigger than Trump's Make America Great PAC, a little bit slightly bigger. So that shows you that it's impactful for fundraising as well as actual votes. And, um, you know, it's great that Trump spoke at Nashville. It's great that Ro Khanna, a Democrat, is also catalyzing, hopefully, um, Vice President Harris's uh, deeper study of it because it should be bipartisan. It should be a bipartisan effort where both sides actually can help the community of crypto come to a fair, uh, sensible standard so that everyone can develop. That is a subject here at the uh, blockchain applications conference at Stanford where, you know, a lot of the applications that they people want to develop is somewhat dependent on uh, removing uncertainty in the regulatory path. Now, moving back to utility, specifically on your blockchain, last week we learned that the California DMV made history by leveraging blockchain technology to modernize vehicle title management. The department has digitized 42 million car titles on Avalanche. In the first move like this in the U.S., the project will allow California residents to claim their titles through an app using a verifiable credential. Can you take us through some of the benefits of this digitization of car titles? Well, it's not just digitizing car titles. Anytime you have, when you have many, many people in a ecosystem, many partners, many people using it, many rails, if you will, of information distribution and possibly also value exchange, putting them on a database called the blockchain database where there's transparency, better security, and everyone can actually are plugged in interoperable. The interoperability is better. So there's that uh, situation. There's also many other situations putting IP on the chain. That's another big subject, especially in front of AI, putting actually IP associated with creators content. And that's going to be very, very important going into um, AI as an AI adoption comes. There's gaming companies trying to tokenize in-game assets and putting it on the chain. These complex workflows are streamlined when you put it on a blockchain. Okay, that's all we have for Crypto World today. We'll be back here again tomorrow. We'll see you then.